he took for short trips, wearing the clothes I laid out for him that morning, the ones he called his incognito clothes. He raised the claw of his hand and waved it at me. I was on my knees in the garden, and I put down my spade to wave back at him. And I watched him as he went away, growing smaller in my sight, until he turned the corner by the willow, and I saw him no more. It would be easy to say I had the feeling I was seeing him for the last time, but in saying that, to claim myself to be some kind of prophetess? But no, that feeling, a mixture of sorrow, fondness, and fear, welled up in me whenever he went away. And yet, he always came back safely, until the time he didn't. I had the same feeling when my husband went down into the mine, but the feeling wasn't any stronger the day the black damp got him and the black Maria brought him home. My husband, who called me his canary whenever I sang, nor was the feeling any stronger when Father went off on that vacation to New York City. Not the place I would go for rest and relaxation, being more inclined to a cabin at a lake or a house at a seashore than to a hotel room in a loud, crowded, dirty city where you hurt your neck craning it up at all those buildings, scraping the skies like towers of Babel. All those buildings made of bricks. Those bricks could fall down on your head. I lived there once, so my mother told me. In a hell's kitchen hovel, we got out by the grace of God. Once I had to go back to New York City, and I was so frightened, I left before the sun went down. Wouldn't want the night to catch me there. Now, a spa like the wealthy people go to, that might be pleasant, but I don't know how I would take to being waited on, having waited upon others all my life. When he saw me in the garden, he must have thought I was getting ready for planting, putting in the rhubarb and the cucumbers he liked sliced and swimming in vinegar. That strong black tea with all that lemon. He liked it like a penance. But I wasn't planting anything. I was burying the cat, Willie, the one who ran away and went wild a year ago. I was burying him before my daughter saw him. I found him on the porch in the morning when I went to get the milk, all curled up like when he slept in father's chair and we had to chase him out, curled up like he was still inside his mother's belly. The smell of death wasn't on him yet. He looked content, but he was dead, so I dug his hole and I put him in it. And I don't know if the bishop would approve but I said a prayer for whatever kind of soul he had. When my husband was buried, I wanted to claw my way down to him. It was my daughter who kept me alive. Wouldn't do to have the May Queen crying. When the last century was fading, when 1899 was coming to an end, there were people preaching in the parks and writing in the papers, saying we'd never make our way to 1900, quoting from the book of Revelation, repent, the end is near, the last time is approaching. Apoplectic. Apocalyptic. So, I read it for myself, the book of Revelation. And now, I only have a sixth grade education, but I read it well enough, and it scared me. All those signs and marks and seals and beasts, it kept me up at night. And when I finally fell asleep, I would dream about those beasts. The one with the seven heads and the lamb with the horn who speaks like a dragon. Speaks like a dragon? Who even knew a dragon could speak? Well, I went to the priest, and I had to listen to him scold me, gently scold me, chide. I had to listen to him chide me for reading the Bible without, without clerical supervision. Who is this John who wrote the book of Revelation, I asked him. Is this the John of the New Testament? We don't know, he said, but he's the John you should be reading. The one who said, God is light, and there is no darkness in him. He was a kind man. Not that we didn't have our differences. The election last November, would I be voting for Brian or McKinley? Oh, that's right, you're not enfranchised. Himself with that drawl he sometimes took. It was just after Mass, just after I took the Eucharist. Got on my breath and I wanted to curse him. Pour the coffee on his head. Well, you'll have the bitter and the sweet like you do with a married couple. Oh, no, 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 sometimes you hear about a priest and a housekeeper living like man and wife. Rumors, but no. A lonely life. Adams without Eve's. Necessary, though, the church says. Although the Protestant clergy seem to manage marriage well enough. Maybe he got tired of the loneliness. Maybe he went off to escape it. Sometimes he would look at me. You know that look, the way a man looks at a woman. As if he were wondering if he hadn't been a priest. As if he were having second thoughts. Second thoughts. And then... I wondered if he hadn't been a priest. Do you think I should confess that? Tell that on my knees to a priest in a confessional? So 
Some would say I should. Some, not I. I would not say I should. There were a few moments when he wasn't on my mind. And, of course, I prayed for him. The whole church would have been praying for him. Maybe if they told the truth, it would have made a difference. All the parishioners praying for him? Maybe God would have heard them. In absentia, the curates had to refer to him, to refer to the priest, I mean. All the things he missed while he was missing. He missed the spring unfolding. He missed forsythias blazing like the sun. The crocuses and daffodils and tulips popping up in sequence. The lilacs bringing forth their incense. And the maple seedlings floating down like green wings of angels. I watched the miners as they went down into the, the shaft in the morning, down into the ground, and I wondered if it broke their hearts going into the black, dripping dance when the world above was lovely. And then I wondered if they came back above the ground into the light, if it was like coming back to life again. He missed baptisms, weddings, death calls for extreme unctions he missed. And then my daughter asked if I had seen a cat, and I lied to her, not telling her I buried him in the garden. One night, when it was almost dark, something flew into my bedroom. Something black, a bat, I thought, covering my head, knowing that I could give you lice. And in the little light I could see, it was a bird, a grackle or a starling, too small to be a crow. So I covered my eyes, knowing that a trapped bird could peck your eyes out. It flew wildly, bumping into the walls and the ceiling, and then I thought I heard the panic beating of its heart, but it was my own heart that I heard. And then it flew back out through the window into its dark nest. And now I didn't say a word about it, knowing that a bird in the house is a sign of death approaching. Only a superstition, I told myself. After all, death is always approaching. And then I remembered when I was scared by the book of Revelation, and he told me, quoting John, God is light, and there is no darkness in him. And then I wondered if maybe there is darkness in God, the darkness that hides things and makes them go missing. <coughs> and then I wondered if maybe God himself was missing. <coughs>